Um, so, okay, like I said, like I said last week, I, I felt a little bit out of my depth um, with the content. But um, then when, and I was, I was 100% planning on um, just presenting what the previous group had done before. Um, but um, then last night I was actually going through um, the chapter again and I was like, hey, um, this reminds me a lot of what my week has been like and um, what I've actually, um, what I've actually been doing in my PhD. Um, so what I'm going to present today, I'm not going to show you guys any code. Um, I'm just going to explain a little bit about my domain and um, kind of the problems that I'm having at the moment and why this is why this is relevant. And um, unfortunately, what I'm planning on doing next in my data analysis, I can't do in tiny models, um, but that's, um, but yeah, that's how it goes. So um, yeah, let me get started. Um, how do I share my screen? Before I share my screen, let me just make sure that I'm on the right. Um, oh, there we go. Okay. So, so basically, the field that I'm in um, is um, sensory science. So, in sensory science, we we generally interested in two um, two different questions, and this is this is generally um, considered kind of two two separate branches um, of sensory science, but they are very much complementary um, to one another. So you'll usually, you might do only one of the two, but usually you land up kind of doing both of the, these at the same time. Um, so the first aim is to use people um, as instruments and um, to use um, people to describe um, how their experiences of products are different um, from one another. Um, so we do this by, by um, training people, um, making sure they're using um, the same words for the same things and making sure they're using more or less the same, same scales. Um, so, and we use this to to kind of get a get a. I like to think of it as um, you are literally treating your your um, participants as uh, measuring instruments. Um, for example, a GCMS, and you can't. Um, so you're op optimizing that process, and you can't ask a GCMS what it thinks about things. So you're literally just using them to measure. The other. Um, the other aim is to um, ask um, people how much they enjoy um, products or experiences. And this is used in a little bit more of a, a marketing and product development um, context where you are giving um, naive people, people that have not been trained, um, products or hypotheses and um, asking them um, usually on a nine pointed on a scale, how much they enjoy the experience, but there there are a bunch <coughs> of accepted methods to um, actually actually measure these kinds of things. Um, so we've got a couple of very specific challenges um, with data in sensory science. Um, so the first challenge um, is that um, people are inherently different um, from one another. Um, so um, there's genetic differences in people that um, that that um, that influence literally how they uh, experience products. Um, there's also um, cultural differences, which means that um, people might have different words to describe um, different things, or they might have different contexts to food, which affects um, how much they enjoy things. Um, and there are also um, psychological differences which, which affect how people respond in a testing scenario and, for example, how they might um, differ in something like scale use. And um, this difference between people is actually what my PhD um, is very much about. So I'm very interested in um, it, 
well, one specific area of difference, which I'm not going to get into, but how different areas of difference are related to one another. Um, but what this difference between people means is that you have a lot of variation in your data. So you've got, you've got an, I kind of want to say an insane amount um, of variability, but it doesn't matter how much you try to control for it, you're going to have variability that you're not able to explain. Um, the other challenge is that your, your data is very expensive. And the reason why your data is expensive is usually you have to um, either get people to come into a lab um, and um, sometimes you do it over several different sessions. You have to give them usually physical products to consume. Um, obviously, in um, the current times, we can't have people coming into a lab or you can't have lots of people coming into a lab at the same time. So you have to have people come in um, one by one um, or you have to send them products, which also adds to the cost. So generally we limited um, in the number of observations. And um, for example, um, a study with consumers, if you've got more than 200 observations, you are doing a phenomenal job. Um, sometimes you've got maybe 400 observations and you, you, then you, you know, you're still um, trying to look at what is different um, underneath. And then the third challenge is that the data structure is, um, is three-way. And I'm gonna explain this in a little bit more detail in my next slide, but um, there's usually people as your um, first way in your data. So your first dimension, um, then you've got um, variables. So for example, if you're looking at products being described, you've got the different descriptors that people are using, and then you've got, um, then you've also got the different products. Um, and for this reason, um, domain expertise is very, very important um, because it can be, um, it can be difficult to um, interpret your data correctly um, if you don't have domain expertise. And this, this also has impacts um, for modeling. Also, because of these challenges, we are usually not that interested in predictive modeling, um, although it, there are some people that do do predictive modeling. Um, we are more interested in um, exploratory stuff. Um, and we're also interested in, um, in, for example, just uh, more predicting um, like classifications. So if you um, look at the, the data structure in sensory, um, sorry, that's my law <laughs> to get up. Um, so um, you've got, your data is usually um, structured in, in three ways. Your data is usually a, a cube. And typically what we tend to do is we tend to, um, tend to unfold um, the data and, and usually we do PCA for, um, for signal ex extraction. And what we would typically do is we would find a mean um, over judges. So then you've got your data, then your, your data is flattened into two ways. Um, or what you can do is you can, um, if you want to preserve the differences between um, your judges, is you just unfold, um, you unfold the, the data and use it like that, but that becomes um, very, very difficult to interpret. Um, so this is the problem that I'm having at the moment. So like I, I said, my PhD is um, very interested in how people are different from one another. So we, um, we can't really find means um, over people and use that as our unfolded data. So the experiment that I'm, that I, that I'm looking at the moment is I've got data on behavior and responses. And so we have participants, um, we've got um, 18 um, food and beverage items and um, they didn't actually taste these. So this is not from, this is actually from an online experiment. Um, but then I've got um, five temperature categories and um, I asked them a very structured kind of question about their responses to these um, categories. 
So my data is three way in this way. Um, this is a completely new experimental method. Um, nobody's ever done this before. So um, we are just seeking to understand um, what's going on. We not um, we not really doing predictions here. Um, so I'm in the exploratory phase, and this is um, a PCA that I did um, on my raw data. It's um, there's there's something missing. So each of these um, these are the the loading, so these are the the um, the variables, um, and the labels on the on the um, data points are basically the 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 products. And um, there's an additional label that you can add on here as well, which is the the temperatures. Um, the this plot is colored by just the product categories, um, but uh, this plot isn't that important, um, except to show you that it is very, very difficult to interpret. And this is one of uh, many plots that I did last week, um, sort of trying to visualize this in different ways, um, going through the different pr principal components, um, adding different labels, adding different color structures. And I was like, okay, this, I'm not making any, there's, there's nothing um, coming out from this, which is leading me towards what the next step would be. Um, so what I was thinking was um, firstly, um, doing uh, multiple PCAs. Um, so um, for example, splitting the data first by, um, you know, doing one PCA per consumer or one PCA per product or one PC PCA per, um, per temperature. Um, I also um, considered doing a um, multiple factor analysis, which is, is which essentially uses that process um, of, um, of doing a whole bunch of PCAs and putting that in um, one model. But here, you also have to make the choice of what you what you are going to use um, as your base, and this is the this is where this relates to um, the chapter at hand um, because this is a this is a tuning parameter, and this is also a um, a parameter um, for um, overfitting. So. Um, what I did in my masters is I used um, something called um, Parafac, which is um, parallel factor analysis, um, which is a constrained um, version of PCA. So it's it is designed to work on three or more ways of data. And so with a PCA, how you're extracting your signal is you first um, you first extracting your your first um, factor where you're modeling the most variation and then you are um, extracting subsequent components that have to be be orthogonal and so a lot um, depends on what your first component is but um, also that constraint um, of it being orthogonal um, actually has quite a big impact um, and what um, Parafac does is it chooses the same first principal component, um, but then you subsequently um, calculate um, factors in um, successive directions of variance, but it also recalculates um, your factors until they con converge. And what this means is that you actually modeling the data um, more directly um, than you are um, modeling the noise. And um, so yeah, so Parafact models less noise, it's um, easier to interpret. And um, it's also a simpler model than PCA um, because it's uh, more constrained. Um, so it means that by definition, um, this model is going to fit data not as well as PCA, um, but what it means also is that um, that it's more um, 
correct because it's a because it's a simpler model. Um, it also handles uh, missing data better than PCA, but that's um, that's just something um, that's relevant for me. And so what I'm going to do in the next slides is I'm going to just show you um, some example, just one example from um, my masters, um, where and I think this might help to make sense of why um, why this is so um, relevant. So um, what I did in my masters is I um, I worked on the sensory analysis of wine. Um, so I added a bunch of um, chemicals in a, in a um, very structured way um, to wine. So here are my observations, the labels of my observations has to do with um, what I actually added to them. Um, and this has to do with a wine fault called Brettanomyces, where it typically makes an elastoplast type um, flavor. Um, so this is this um, elastoplast um, descriptor that's um, over here, but also you are looking at um, medicinal and savory characteristics that are coming in. But if you just, if, and so this is from an experiment that I did, and I actually did, did these tastings with the people, and the interpretation of this relied a lot on actually doing the univariate statistics um, at the same time. And it relied a lot on domain expertise, because if you just look at this PCA, you would think that um, this pungency is one of the more um, important um, descriptors here. And you would also not think that um, this elastoplast um, descriptor is that important. And from my experience um, with the experiment, um, this, this descriptor is something that was actually um, a lot clearer and it's also a lot more relevant. Um, but my hypothesis was that um, participants are, are being um, very conservative in the way in which they're using the scale. So they're not using the scale in the same way um, than with um, the other descriptors. So when um, I um, did Tarifac, um on the same data, um, these two descriptors, so um, the elastoplast descriptor and the barrier-like descriptor, which, which is the main difference between um, the samples, came out a lot more clearly. Um, and, you know, if I hadn't had domain expertise, um, this would have actually given me more insights um, than doing, you know, fitting the model that is that is more, um, that's, that's fitting better, but is actually um, just uh, modeling um, more noise. And um, this is um, just the, this second set of, two factors, which basically just gives me another level of insight. And um, you know, that's basically what I wanted to share with you guys. Um, I know it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit from a weird angle, but um, I thought that this, um, that this touched on a lot of the issues in the chapter. Um, and perhaps if you're not sure how this is touching on the issues in the chapter, I can explain, I can explain in a little bit more, you know, in, you know, I can help to um, connect the dots, but um, yeah, that's, um, that's basically what I wanted to share. So any questions? I had a couple. Uh, thank you. That's that's super interesting. Um, so I guess so. With the if you go back to those plots with the um the PC the the Parafact plots with like the different. I was just curious, like where so the labels that are on those. Uh, so those are the labels from like the experimental condition. Is that right? Or, um, uh, so the numbers. The, the uh, sorry, like the actual words, like uh, elastoplast or. Oh, so uh, the so those labels are the descriptors that people use. So basically, what we what we did is we, as the first part of the the experiment, we trained people. So we gave them lots of. You know, we we started with 
how we expected the samples to um, actually taste like. We familiarized them. We um, we landed on a, a on a set vocabulary. We um, then trained them on that vocabulary with different um, reference standards. Um, and then how I collected my data in this experiment is you then had a we had a scale for each of these descriptors and for each sample that people tasted they had to rate how intense the sample was um, on each of those descriptors. Well, I think that makes sense. Um, well, and, and you mentioned that part of it you can't do in tidy models, or is that the parafac? Parafac you can't do yeah. in tidy models yet. Um, so that I I'm going to you know that's how it how it is, um, and I actually find it kind of cool that I that, you know the thing that I need to do I can't do in tidy models, and I'm going to open an issue on um, on GitHub and maybe they'll they'll add it um, because I'm also. I'm starting to realize that this this way of uh, modeling sensory data is something that we should be doing generally as sensory scientists. Um, as sensory scientists, we tend not to be, um, you know, data scientists. We tend to not be that good at R. We tend to kind of do the things that 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 are made easier for us. Um, so. I think it would be actually a really good contribution to our field if this can start to be used a lot more and um, a lot more than it has been used. Sounds good. I, I, when I first looked at Teddy Mal, the book, uh, while well, like before this book club, when it was further, like a little less long in development, I feel like I saw some chapters about creating custom, uh, like uh custom steps but also yeah like custom steps and custom like estimators or models uh or like engines like i i saw that somewhere and i don't see it in the book anymore uh i don't know i was thinking you could also write your own uh you know pre-processing or just implement what package you're using as a you yeah, know just I, this tidy models framework yeah, yeah I, I might I might try that, but that's that's definitely you know above my level of of our expertise. Considering um, considering that I'm very much still a, a newbie to this, but I might I might try. Um, but um, yeah, when I when I just also found really you know what I found um, what I found really cool about this and the the chapter as well is just the you know the concept of um going you want your model to fit as well as possible um but having your model fit well is not necessarily the best thing because if your model is fitting better you are probably modeling noise and you're not modeling that which is go really going on um, and um, that was yeah that was illustrated actually quite well in the slides from the other from the other group um, and yeah so that's my that's my lesson and my story from um, from this week's from this week's chapter. Any other questions? I also want to look at the, I'm looking at the link now to build my own. Oh, there it is. Thanks, August. Yeah. I felt like it was like actually in the book before, but maybe I'm wrong. Uh, I just, I don't know. It's quite complicated. <laughs> to be fair, it's not. It's not like um, I've seen. I've seen some attempts for people to try on GitHub, and it's not. Um, it's not easy. Um, but you could definitely do it. You know, and also going back to the, you know, when you're saying that you're not particularly experienced at it. Don't worry. Um, none of us are, you know, experts in our like, you know, even Hadley Wickham says 
that um, he's always learning new things. Um, the best thing you can do in art, and this is, you know, 100% the case, I think, for virtually everyone who's ever spent any time learning it, is just try to do new things. And even if you're outside your depth, just give it a go, because you'll learn so much by doing that. And, uh, you know, when I started my new job, uh, my, my current job is, I thought, oh, I know time series. Started doing this job and it's just like blew my mind and constantly had to work a lot harder at learning R and learning all this other stuff. But it's just pushed my knowledge really far forward. And that's just by doing project work, really. And the same happens, like, in a scientific setting, you end up doing like a lot of like uh, standardized processes. And I, I think as you pointed out, by going down a non-standardized process that people don't use so often, you actually found out something a lot more interesting. And it's the same thing with like, when it comes to like you're attempting, when you're attempting to learn how to program uh, statistics, you're forced to uh, into new avenues, new pathways, and you just pick things up, little block here and here. Um, you know, I can't tell you how incompetent I was in the past. <laughs> Um, actually, I, I may as well. Um, I, the first test I ever did on R uh, was during my master's um, and I failed it. And that's the reason why I then spent so much time learning about it. Um, <laughs> consequently, now it's my job to spend all my time in R. Um, but if I hadn't been for failing that test and having to, you know, do some, to try a lot harder on it, I'd have never do the job that I do today. Um, uh, hopefully... That's somewhat um, you know, I, 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 I hear you and I agree. Um, I, I, where I'm at at the moment, though, is I, I'm not even really sure how to run the, the model with the packages that are already there. Um, and the thing that I'm also learning from a, from a more you know, self-management perspective is that I have to be careful about spending too much time um, learning things that are not relevant for me to move forward um, mm. because uh, as fun as it sounds to you know to try and implement Parafac in tidy models um, that is not what my PhD is about uh, so no I completely get it you've got you've got to be pragmatic um, you know <coughs> it will be yeah. there and like you know you've only got so much time in the world I mean, yeah. I, I stress out just doing two book clubs, let alone, you know, having to do a PhD on top of that. So, <laughs> I'm doing a third book club as well. I'm doing, I'm running the, the R for Data Science book club with my research group, which we're starting this week. So, um, <laughs> that's, um, but that should be fun because that's, that's relatively, that's relatively um, basic stuff. So, um and it's yeah, but yeah, probably the implementation of um, of Parafac in in um, Pydo models might be like for a postdoc for me. Um, so yeah, we'll see. <laughs> we'll see where things go. Well, oh, maybe it's something that we can ask um, ask them to add into the book if they can add a chapter on um, on how to or dem create a demonstration on how to actually um, build our own parsnip models. So that it seems a little less intimidating than looking at yeah, this that's a, that's a that's a good idea. And and also to be honest, and this is me being I know I'm probably being a little bit hypercritical here, but what I found is that that the book is very much focused on predictive modeling, mm -hmm. um, which is great and it it definitely has its place. Um and I think for you know for 90% or maybe 70% of people who call themselves data scientists, um, predictive modeling is a very big part of what you're trying to do. Um, but they, but they are, they are spaces where predictive modeling isn't what you're trying to do. And it isn't, um, it isn't, it isn't in scope. Um, but the tools of, of tiny models um, still remain relevant. Um, and I kind of I kind of wish that there was a, you know, there was a parallel, um, there was a parallel, you know, part of the book, like part two, if you're not trying to do predictive modeling, this is how you would, 
um, or, you know, an appendix or something going, you know, this is how you would approach it if you're trying to solve a different kind of problem. I think that um, the other book club, which we're doing, um, the uh, regression and other stories yeah. book club, is perhaps more useful for the kind of uh, for more general scientific work. Um, because it's a lot more focused on probability distributions and analyzing uh, differences. Um, whereas with- hey, There's a book club on that book? On regression and other stories, really? Yeah, no. uh, yeah I'll send you the link, link actually. I just, yeah. I just got that book, okay. Yeah. Oh, dude, we, that is we very- did, yeah. 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 We're doing the first chapter on, on Wednesday or Thursday or Tuesday or whatever day it is in your world, but- This one, right? Uh, yeah, yeah. All right. <laughs> what? <laughs> Mine is over there. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, yeah we, we haven't really started the meaty stuff yet, so you're welcome to join us. I would love to. Uh, it's, it's out of this, this community, right? Um, yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, yeah, send me the link. I would be definitely be interested. Yeah. Um, um, anyway, yeah, but so, and the, but the thing though is is that um, because of the because of the way in which our data works in in century science, um, regression stuff is also usually not that relevant um, because of the the amount of the amount of variation um, and the amount of um, and the amount of you know the way in which the data is structured, and what I've actually what I've actually found in my um, in my PhD, what I've found very challenging is my um, because I worked in industry for many years before I started my PhD, and I um, I was I'm very good at the multivariate stuff, and I understand that like I understand that like that's my I don't want to say my second language because my second language is English. Um, but I, you know, I understand that like it's one of, you know, it's like that. Um, but um, when you're looking at the more, you know, the more normal, even, you know, the regression stuff, the Bayesian stuff, I, um, I don't know that stuff at all. Um, so it's a gap in my knowledge. So, you know, so that's why I joined that book club. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's the the as for the regression of stories. It's, um, I'm not really a Bayesian. I kind of understand a little bit about probability distributions, but I'm mostly frequentist um, because I come from a traditional scientific background, which was ANOVA, T tests, frequentist stuff, which is yeah. great as it mentions in the book. It's got its place. It definitely does have its place, um, but Bayesian is. It, it certainly is superior uh, in, yeah. in many scenarios. Um, but um, as, as for the tidy models, um, a lot of the framework is designed for, um, it's designed for um, iteration. Uh, so as constant, yeah. it will then tend to cater for uh, more kind of like scaling activity. Whereas with scientific activity, you're often looking at um, individual models. I mean, unless of course, you know, you, you see it a lot less in, um, you know, uh, bioinformatics. Um, so there's a lot more in that of r repetition over and over again. And you certainly see, see that across the field. And that's also why it's such great uh, mathematical models and systems being created um, by uh, groups like Bioconductor. But for, you know, your average, uh, average scientist, uh, so if there is such a thing, you tend to use, um, you know, I would argue, say you, use less models for um, just generally, particularly in social sciences, even if you do use complex systems like structural equational modeling and network analysis and such like that, but you're not building like many, many, many models. And I think that's where the strength of tiny mm. models often comes in it is for doing that. But you're right, we should be doing a lot more, they probably should be doing a lot more robust um, um, and rigorous testing in, in scientific methods, because as uh, Luke showed in his presentation, um, just by picking the first model out, you can often pick out a poor model um, because you might be, because it's over, it's fitting to the data yeah. too much. Um, 
Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I can see where your frustration is. I, I found myself frustrated yeah. when I was uh, uh, when I was studying and particularly uh, when I was doing things like factor analysis as well. It, it was a pain. Yeah, but and and you know my my frustration. It's not really a frustration. It's just the it's just the comment is that um, my big challenge with um, modeling stuff in R and this is also as me being very much a newbie is um, that um, thing which which they put out in the beginning of tiny models. Going, we are making things we. We, we standardizing the, the structure that your data is supposed to be in and we standardizing the way in which you have to write um, your equations. And usually um, that's where I land up getting stuck um, because the, and, and that's actually where I'm stuck at the moment um, in Parafac um, is the way in which the documentation of packages are written is not always at the same level. And sometimes it's written in a way that assumes a lot of things which I don't know and I don't understand. Um, so, and it shouldn't be that way um, because it's not that difficult. It's not that complex. Um, so, yeah, so that's, you know, and that's maybe, a, it's maybe a different, a different use case for tidy models, but, I think um, I, I agree with what you're getting at. Um, I think uh, when Hadley Wickham joined uh, the R community, um, or, or certainly became such a prominent force in it, um, I just wish that everything had been constructed by him. Um, but the mm. but what he did was start to change the way how we think about how we write and create documentation. Because if you look at the reason why Python, in many respects, is ahead of R in some areas and not others. It's not so good in certain aspects of analytics, not so good at wrangling data and all of that kind of thing. But it is great when it comes to uh, a lot of the um, more advanced computational stuff. And that's because it's designed mostly by people who work in computer sciences. And as a consequence, they have incredible documentation processes, which they learn from university and carry on throughout their careers. Mm. Whereas a lot of the R community is a lot of academics and they've got very different approaches, which aren't always as clear cut or yeah. to assume knowledge, as you point out. Whereas if you look at the data, the um, compute, uh, computer science groups, they don't assume knowledge. They, they assume that they start, you're starting at the level of five-year-old in many yeah, cases. Because, but, but also because computer scientists are programmers at heart. So they are used to having to explain everything to a computer so you have to be you know you have to tell it everything where if you're a you know if you're kind of a scientist or an educated heart that you know you kind of have to be like okay let's think what the person that I'm talking to knows and you know that assumption is often higher than it should be um, where it should be when you're writing documentation I think they don't know anything Mm. I think they don't well, barely anything. I mean, the biggest issue is every, a, anyone can create a package, and a lot of packages are really, really useful. But how they create the package, as you say, is not entirely standardized. And the whole point of the tidyverse and tidy models is mm. to start that standardization process off and hopefully we move that way. I mean, like, if you look at, like, um, I mean, you don't do time series, but if you're doing time series, you'd see um, that model time and time TK have basically just taken those same processes and applied them to time series and bioconductor as well they kind of follow they're not so tidy but they do follow very strict structures uh, which are which make s4 seem a little simpler uh, even though it isn't i think it's a long i think it's a long journey i think um in a way r is starting to move in a direction where we're getting back in documentation better processes and uh, hopefully it will link things up better in the future but in the meantime we'll just steal stuff from python <laughs> i was going to say the other thing anita that uh, i thought of when you said that it wasn't it was built for prediction or we talked a lot about we, we the book talk, focuses a lot about on predictive models um i would say like something like anomaly detection is something that i do i do a lot in my job and um like it's kind of I don't know it's kind of like the majority 
in what I do, I guess, in some ways. And um, like, it, like you could, it could be based on a predictive model, like with, you know, defining what ex expectation is and all that with like a confidence interval and stuff. But like, there are some methods that are like kind of made for anomaly detection. And um, that, that would just be another example of something that mm -hmm. I don't think is really incorporated into tidy models at all. Like, like I think it'd be really, I don't know, maybe I'll try at some point, but make, like there's this model I use, there's an algorithm I use a lot, it's called the isolation forest. And um, I think it'd be just even interesting as like a, as like a pre-processing step to, to, be, to add like an anomaly score or something to every observation. Um, and before, if, even if you, you're doing prediction afterwards. So anyway, I just, I was just thinking about your, your point about like the different use cases. And uh, I think that's another one that, um, I don't know, but I, but I guess it's, it's not really structured around use cases and I guess, right? Like it's kind of more about the functionality and like the features yeah. of the package. So maybe that's also something like, it's like here are the features and you could go do what you want to do with it, you know? Um, so I don't know. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Sorry, no, I, I was just thinking about what you said. Um, and one of the, the link that I added was uh, actually on how to build a parsnip model, but actually what in some cases we want to do is, because you know, we, we, this is about tuning really, um, is how do you build pre-processing pre steps that you can then apply, for instance, the tune parameters to? Because that seems a lot more complex than just creating a new engine for parsnip. Mm -hmm. um, a, a while a while ago i like did the i saw it, there was an article just like the one you shared but for step like step function like step whatever step uh i forget the general name for it but i did i did that for uh this matrix profile algorithm and like it actually wasn't too bad to do and i i can dig it up and share maybe i'll put it on github or something but um mm -hmm. uh but yeah yeah like that's also kind of like another anomaly detection like uh, algorithm um, uh, or focus algorithm, I guess. But um, I would love to know more about that. Um, yeah, I actually learned about it. On <laughs> anomaly this. detection is just the bane of my life. <laughs> I learned about it on this Slack or on, I think it was on this Slack channel. Um, it's super interesting. And I, honestly, I've used it less in my work than I had thought I would when I first learned about it. But um, it's, it's pretty neat. Like it, like has, it's, it's like kind of simple, but it's the, 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 I guess the, the amazing part of it is like the efficiency at which it does like, uh, uh, basically like segment compares segments of, uh, of like a time series to all the other segments of that, that same time series, um, in a really efficient way. And you get like a distance measure for every, for every segment. Um, that is yeah, sorry. That is actually very relevant for one of the other questions in my PhD. So. Oh, okay. Cool, cool. Yeah, it, it is like super fast. Uh, it's 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 and I think it's like pretty interpretable because then you get like just like a this like out profile output where it's like um, where uh, you get like for every point the closest or the, sorry for every segment the closest segment to that segment in, within the same time series and then. Um, and then the distance. And so you kind of, and then you see like a kind of a, and you get like a time series of like distances and it's pretty easy to, to like if you wanted to then apply some kind of classification for anomaly detection, mm -hmm. like it, it gives you a pretty good uh, feature. Uh, I, yeah, I, I guess like, yeah, I think a lot of it, a lot of it is, is like just like feature engineering, like a, that, like a, as, as its usefulness. Um, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's pretty neat, pretty neat, I think. Um, um. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so, I think that's it for this week. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> it was good to see you guys you folks good to see you guys too um see you on tuesday
Yes, Wednesday for me. Oh, is it Wednesday? I'm, oh, yeah. I'm in the future. Thanks. <laughs> oh, thanks, thanks for your presentation. It's super, really interesting topic. Um, Pleasure. Uh, Bye. 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 Take care.